is one of the most customer centric companies you can think about. Difficult customers are the best customers to have because they really push your limit. And your consumers want to see content that reflects, you know, the social fabric. The starting point of this whole business excellence framework is in terms of understanding who our customers are. problem, I already referred to this, is that customer centricity is the marketing department's job or it's the sales department's job. Not at all. It is virtually everybody's job. Anybody who does anything that touches a customer directly or indirectly, he or she is responsible for customer centricity. So that's one big mistake that a lot of companies make. Second uh, mistake that some companies make is they become customer compelled rather than customer centric. See, here's the thing. Uh, customer centric doesn't mean thou shalt do everything that every customer asks for. That doesn't work. Uh, we need to identify, a customer centric company needs to identify how it can make customers' lives better, create more value for customers, and derive value from having created that additional value for a customer. So, you know, <clears throat> uh, if you're a retailer, the simplest thing, um, to give you a very trivial example, customer says, hey, can you cut the price in half? And you say, well, I need to be customer centric. Let me cut the price in half. No, that's not being customer centric. That's being customer compelled. We don't want to be compelled by customers. We want to understand customers so that we can create more value for them, so that we can extract more value and uh, create value for ourselves. So that's another important thing we wanna keep in mind. Third thing that uh, many people uh, wrongly believe that customer centricity means delivering higher quality products at higher prices to customers. Uh, that may be true for some, but that doesn't mean that uh, a low price a competitor is not customer centric, not at all. There are many customers for whom price is the most important thing. And if I want to be customer centric, then I need to focus on price, meaning I need to work backwards on what's the minimum acceptable quality to such a customer and how can I bring the costs of my operations down so that I can charge the lowest, uh, uh, lowest price to this customer. And then there are also a whole bunch of customers in between. <clears throat> they buy combinations of quality and prices. And I need to be clear, am I operating at the very high end, at the very low end, or somewhere in between? And if I'm somewhere in between, what's the right combination of quality and price, which will attract a given segment of customers? And then the last thing that, <clears throat> That's a huge problem, actually, uh, and I'll uh, talk about this. You know, the market always gives you mixed signals. Some customers say, oh, I think this will be nice. Others say, no, this, won't, this is not very good. Some customers say, well, your services needs to be improved. So there are all kinds of uh, mixed signals that the market gives us. Uh, we come up with rival plans, and it's very hard to vet a plan against another, given that the soundness of a plan only becomes clear after you've implemented it. So whenever we make uh, projections or predictions, uh, there's no right or wrong. You can make educated guesses, but nonetheless, they are educated guesses. So oftentimes what happens is companies get really stymied, not stymied, companies get uh, sort of uh, like a deer with headlights uh, in its eyes, they get frozen. They don't do anything at all because they don't know what to do. And that's a huge problem. And the simple answer to this is, this responsibility is at the senior level of an organization. You take into account everything that you've heard, learned, make an educated bet, and basically indicate to the people, some companies have this mantra, Intel actually started it. Uh, you know, we have, Tremendous debates, but then after that, we'll make a decision and whether you agree or not doesn't matter. 
you need to commit to that decision that's been made. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. Let me go over uh, <clears throat> some drivers of organizational, uh, rather organizational drivers of customer centricity. Four key drivers. Number one, management. And there are lots of things over here. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but let me make a few points. Um, management, the top management sets the tone. There's absolutely no denying that. <clears throat> if, if the CEO of an organization doesn't believe in customer centricity, it's not gonna happen. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's not gonna happen. The CEO of a company absolutely has to believe in it and has to constantly job on, uh, on that. Another thing about top management is risk taking. If a senior manager isn't willing to change, you know, anytime, see customer centricity means changing in response to customer requirements and customer needs and preferences. And anytime you change, there's some risk that you might fail. And if a CEO or top management is unwilling to take that risk and is going to punish everybody for every single failure, there's no way you can become customer centric. You have to have, uh, you have to have some level of uh, tolerance for risk and failure. Without that, you can't be customer centric. And let me just uh, offer a few, uh, few points over here. Uh, uh, you know, it's the top management, but it's also junior and uh, mid-management levels. Each level has its own subordinate and each level needs to be emphasizing the importance of customer centricity. Uh, what do you talk about in your monthly review or quarterly review meetings? I, do you talk about financials? Sure, that's important. Do you talk about problems? Yeah, sure, that's important. But how much time do you allocate towards talking about customers and their problems and what we are doing to address those problems? Uh, owning a customer, a number of top managers own a customer. So if that customer has any problem, they contact that senior manager who will get it right. And when people in an organization know that somebody at the very senior level is responsible for a customer, they make sure that they will uh, take care of the customer. <coughs> uh, let me move on. Customer visits is another thing. Uh, you know, don't leave it to the marketing department or the salespeople. Uh, senior managers need to make customer visits. And there are two benefits. One, you generate intelligence from customer visits. But the second thing that happens is it sends a message to the organization that our senior honchos, they know what's going on in the marketplace. You can't pull wool over their eyes and they care about our customers. It sends a very strong value system uh, throughout the organization. So that's number one, different levels of management. Second thing, a customer-centric organization creates what I like to call interaction spaces, spaces where people can interact with each other and share uh, market intelligence. So physical architectures, you know, 3M company designed its building so that it would be uh, conducive to people bumping into each other in the hallways in what they call interaction nodes off of the hallways purely by accident. <clears throat> Design physical spaces so that people would be able to mingle with each other. Uh, there are companies that have ideation rooms specifically dedicated to individual customer industries. So there's a company that serves multiple industries. They'll have one room for the financial services industry, another room for the chemical industry, another room for whatever, all sorts of charts on the walls to remind people in the room who the customer is and what they need to be focusing on. Uh, ref routine reflection times. There are companies that dedicate 15 to 30 minutes every single day to evaluate what happened that day, how did it impact customers, and what are they gonna do to improve on that experience? And other things like you know, sports meet, social events, creating opportunities for people to interact with each other. The third thing I'd like to talk about is people. 
At the heart of customer centricity are the people involved in the organization. And here, a um, couple of things really. Of course, we want competent people, but what we want are people who have a service mindset. You know, if a person doesn't derive pleasure out of serving others, that person is not going to be very customer centric. And we want <clears throat> to staff our organizations with people who believe in serving. And the example, the, uh, we were talking about this the other day, the unbelievable example that always comes to my mind is the Taj incident, the 1122 incident where you know, the Taj Mumbai was attacked by terrorists and there were 2000 employees in that hotel and not one of those employees left the hotel. In fact, many of them lost their lives trying to help their customers escape that bad situation. I mean, that is extreme service mindset. I, I don't know how, much, how replicable that is, but that gives you the idea that if you have the right people, it's much easier to uh, be customer centric. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> reward recognition systems. People do what they are rewarded for. So that's one. But, but uh, what I'd like to sort of point out are that intrinsic rewards are just as important as extrinsic rewards. Uh, you know, if people get pleasure out of doing things that are productive, that make customers' lives better, if they get pleasure out of that, you know, that's a reward unto itself. But of course we want external rewards. We all care about compensation. And so the trick over here is to link compensation to market-based metrics. Things like customer sat, NPS scores, <clears throat> number of complaints, fill rates, um, accurate uh, uh, invoicing, those kinds of things. Uh, if we tie our metri uh, uh, compensation metrics to those kind of metrics, then that fosters customer centricity. So let me just close by saying that there are four organizational drivers of customer centricity. And these links that you see over here are basically saying that, you know, they're all interrelated. You can't have three of them, but not the four, it won't work. You need all four in order to be customer centric. Couple of things, it's about actions. You know, we can, sit in our rooms and say, we care about customers, we value customers, uh, blah, 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 forget it. It's all about actions. If you aren't doing things to make their lives better, to make them more successful, you're not customer centric. And the second thing I'd like to sort of point out, like I have, is that it's not marketing's job or sales job or customer support job. It's everyone's job or almost everyone's job. So just to conclude, customer centricity is about generating market intelligence and imagining possibilities and then sharing them and acting on them. Uh, we need four drivers, management, interaction spaces, people and reward recognition systems. And one more time, it's everyone's job, not just the marketing department's job. So with that, I'd like to end and I'd thank you for your patience and I'll turn it over to Anjali.